This is the Good Neighbor Podcast, the place where local businesses and neighbors come together. Here's your host, Jeremy Wolf. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Good Neighbor Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Wolf, and our guest today, actually, I was uh, I was on Facebook or Instagram a couple weeks ago, and I saw a video that our guest put out, and he was educating folks on the value of paying your mortgage down sooner than the 30 typical 30 year fixed mortgage. I thought I found, found it very useful, uh, threw up a comment there, got to talking to him and actually checked his website. Turns out that uh, we're both alumni of the Southwestern program, uh, summer internship program that we both uh, participated in many, many years back. Well, for me, longer than you. But so today I have Nick Sproul, and Nick joins us from Southwestern Real Estate. Nick, welcome to the yeah. show, brother. Thank you for having me, man. It was, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, no, the pleasure is all ours. And thanks, as always, to our listeners for tuning in. So let's get right into this. Uh, obviously, you're a realtor. Yep. Everybody pretty much knows what a realtor does. But tell us a little bit about your business and what you do specifically at Southwestern Real Estate. I thought you were going to say everybody is a realtor because yeah. pretty, that, pretty that, that is true as well. Yes. You can throw a rock in South Florida and hit a realtor. There's There are actually more realtors in the state of Florida than any other state in the country. And there are more uh, higher concentration of realtors in Southeast Florida than anywhere else in the country. There's about 100,000 realtors in Dave Broward and Palm Beach County. No, um, 100,000. And so I knew I knew there was a lot. And it's not yeah. surprising to me that South Florida is one of the largest concentrations. But right. I didn't I can't even think 100,000. There's about 100,000. And there's only a million and a half realtors in the country. Wow. So yeah, <laughs> uh, we got a, We got a good chunk of them here. But as you know, right, like everyone has a everyone knows somebody that's got a real estate license that they don't actually use. Um, I want to say the statistic is that like 45% of agents nationwide did zero transactions in the last year. Okay. So there's a lot of people that hold a license that are not really active with it, right? Um, this this has been my full-time thing for about eight or nine years now. Um, Southwestern Real Estate is a brokerage that focuses on relationship referrals um, so, you know, my first couple of years in business, I did a whole lot of cold calling when I was with a different brokerage and I was 25 years old. And that was the way for me to start um, growing the business and just kind of getting something moving. But over the last six or so years since I opened Southwestern Real Estate in South Florida, it has been all relationship building and referrals. And we just want to be a resource for people. And we know that that comes back around. Um, so we have a, we, we say we have a 99% drama free approach to real estate. Uh, you know, the, we can't mitigate all the drama, of course, but we can eliminate some of the egos and kind of be the bigger person in a transaction when we need to. Yeah, absolutely. So Southwestern real estate, we're going to get into a lot of this uh, yeah. later. This actually, you have a nexus to the actual Southwestern company that we sold books with. Over, yeah. the, over the summer and i will say let me let me do a little chant here yeah. i don't know if you did this during your time it's a great day to be a book man it's a great yeah. day yeah i know i can't remember the rest of it but I, and i know you you did the program like 10 years after i did i believe right yeah man but but we still did those executive <laughs> exercises in the morning and you know chance just to like hype you up before Look, you go. when you're gonna go out knocking on doors for 12 14 hours a day six days a week if yeah. you don't do something to break the ice in the morning Oh, the yeah. process can be uh, rather interesting. Well, it still is rather interesting. But For sure. so how was Southwestern Real Estate born out, out of Southwestern Company? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm i not the creator of Southwestern Real Estate as a whole, but I'm, okay. the, I'm the managing broker of it. And I brought it to the uh, for the state of Florida. So I brought it to the state of Florida. Um, but about, uh, I don't know, it's probably, probably, you know, 16 or 17 years ago or so now, there was a guy named Patrick Roach who had sold books and was a district sales manager with the Southwestern Advantage Company. Um, and Southwestern Real Estate was born the same way that about 20 or 25 other companies were born, where Pat Roach said, hey, Southwestern, I'm, I'm kind of done with this traveling thing. I'm done with this knocking on doors and teaching people how to do this thing. I got to go be with my family that I'm building here. Uh, but I'm going to go get into real estate. 
And the company said, well, you're awesome. We don't want to lose you. We've already taught you how to do sales and sales management really well. Can we just create a real estate company? So, so they created a real estate company in outside of Chicago, um, somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago. And that was our first office started by Pat Roach up in Chicago land area. Um, and you said there's about 18, cause I know I have another fellow bookman who's also working with, uh, either it's Southwestern consulting or coaching services. So they, yeah. they have a bunch of different models where successful bookmen, yep. just like you said, they got out of the field and like, well, yeah, what can I do now? And uh, that's great. And so Southwestern, and there's, are there still kick, kicking it with the, with the books every summer? Like what's going on there? They, they are literally breaking records. Like when, when COVID happened, they had to shift a little bit and they start. So I started getting phone calls from people that were like, Hey, we can't knock on doors right now. But like, do you have kids? Do you want to buy some books? <laughs> so, so my wife and I bought some books, but, um, but they got, <laughs> they got back in the field and they are, they are literally like, they're breaking records, man. People are surprised to hear that a company that sells physical books now they've they've adapted so they sell online tutoring and software and 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 an online component as well now but man door-to-door sales and physical face-to-face sales and contact it still works man they're breaking records out there now there's a lot of analogs with that to what i i currently do outside this platform i i publish uh, i have some hyper local community publications that go out to residents. I help local businesses promote their brands uh, through a variety of different ways, but it's the same type of mentality, right? You wouldn't think that in today's day and age, certain print businesses would be thriving, but the right type of print product still does really well. And it's been a somewhat of a resurgence really, I think over the last five, five, 10 years, really. I couldn't agree with you more. I, for, for everybody that's in my network, that's a past client or a referral partner or whatever, I send out now we all we all get the emails from our friends that are business owners. And a lot of times they just don't cut through because we get so many emails. But when you get a physical piece of mail and it's something that is actually addressed to you and you're interested to open, that's not junk mail or or, a you know, a credit card bill. You open it, you read it and it sits it sits on your counter for a couple of days. So, you know, you come you, the the the. The radar goes up in somebody's brain a few different times because they've read it once and then it sits on the counter and they walk by it again, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I, I want to I wanna get into more about the real estate, but yeah. I also want to dive a little bit deeper into the uh, experiences through Southwestern program that we did um, what, for me way back when. It seems like a distant memory, but talking a little bit more about the real estate. I know there's been quite a bit of things going on post COVID. Obviously yes. there was uh, things were just through the roof for a while. Um, and then interest rates went crazy. Yeah. What's going on with the market right now? I know interest rates are starting to come down. Yeah. Um, inventory is started. Well, you tell me you're the expert, right? I always yeah. ask realtors that come on to kind of let us know the state of the market and where we're at, where we're going. Um, I would describe the market as, as really like what a normal market is right now. There's, and it is hyper local, right? So if you look at just Cooper city, you're going to get different stats than if you look at Fort Lauderdale, Davie or Coral Springs. Right. Um, so what I will say though, is Broward County is still appreciating values are still rising. They're at about 6% year over year right now. Um, so they're still going up. Inventory has gone up pretty significantly, and that has been mostly due to property staying on market a little bit longer as those interest rates went up. Now, they've come down about a point already from mid sevens to mid sixes in in about the last month or two, but I don't think the market has quite started to feel that yet. There's usually a, a 60 to 90 day lag time from what interest rates do to what the market feels. Um, so the market is pretty like in general, it's, it's normal. There's a lot of areas where they're, they're kind of balanced markets between the supply and demand. Um, specifically in Cooper city, I just ran the numbers on it this morning before jumping on here, but Cooper city has a two and a half month supply of inventory. Um, and, and we would call a balanced market, like a five to six month supply of inventory. 
So even though I say the market is pretty like normal everywhere, properties aren't flying off the market in most places. Cooper City specifically, uh, properties are selling twice as fast as a balanced market. Well, it's a very desirable market due to the school system. And yep. It's just a great, it's a great community. You're in. Yeah. Do you now? Do you live in Hollywood? No. So I opened the brokerage in Hollywood. Okay. We bought our first house in Hollywood. At that time, my business was split um, between Dade and Broward. So I wanted to open right on the border. Uh, now my business is about 90% in Broward. And I moved to Cooper City a couple months ago um, to Rock Creek. I'm in the, the Harbor Point area in Rock Creek. And we love it, man. Nice. nice. We, we got two little ones. So and it's kind of a... Yeah. Just, just gonna ask. So, how, how, how old? My son uh, Dominic is about to turn two, and my daughter Mila is three and a half. And uh, so we're we're in the thick of it, man. Uh, but they both go to um, Primrose, which is right in between where our old house was and our new house is now. It's worked out really well. But yeah, it was a it was a nice factor to be like. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll gladly go west and get more house and never have to pay for private school because the schools are so good here, you know. It's a, it's a win win, yeah. as they say. So, two and three and a half boy and a girl. So, I have a, a 10 year old son. Okay. And a 12 year old daughter. Yeah, perfect. That's in the middle same. school last year, of you know, my son's over at Griffin. Yeah. Uh, and I know it, it, it's so cliche. Everybody always tells you this. When you got little kids, oh, value, you know, value the time while they're young. It really does just go by in a flash. It's a blur. I mean, my daughter, my daughter's 12 and she, I, she swears she thinks she's 17. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, my daughter's three and a half and she thinks she's 12, but <laughs> um, no, but it, I, I, yeah, I hear you. Of course we, we do, we do hear it from everybody and we're trying to when so our son is about to turn two i forgot already my daughter's three and a half but i forgot already what that terrible two phase is like and my son has just started to tantrum all day every day um so <laughs> but we we gotta sit here and try to remind ourselves in the middle of the tantrum to appreciate the chaos because you know one day they won't be here one day we won't have the chaos right um so we've we've seen it and heard it enough that we try to appreciate it, but when you're when you're in the moment and you're getting screamed at by a toddler, it's not always easy. <laughs> what do what do you guys like to do for fun in your downtime, if you have any? Yeah, um, downtime. So I am I am up at four thirty a.m. <laughs> to start my day. That uh, that that late? Come on, man. Yeah, yeah. You should, no. be, you should be up at by it. No later than 3 a.m., dude. Come on. I'm a slacker. I'm I'm doing a 75 hard challenge right now. I've got I, that's I'm, right. I saw that on yeah. social. I, I looked into it a little. Tell us a little bit about that challenge. So that is um two workouts a day, two 45 minute workouts a day, with one of them being an outside workout. So you're somewhere in nature. Um, drink a gallon of water a day, read 10 pages a day, no alcohol for 75 days, stick to your kind of whatever your meal plan is. Um, and I just, you know, Southwestern people, whether they are Southwestern real estate or Southwestern advantage people are just kind of always like, how can I challenge myself to grow and do something that, you know, is ridiculous. Right. Um, uh, so day, what day are you on? I'm on day four. Yeah. It's, it's new. Um, so I'm just, and, gonna, and, and I think I read that if you fail in any one of these things along the way, you got to go right back to day one and reset, yeah, right? Supposed to start over. Yeah. But that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen for you. Now. That's not going to happen. Yeah. You're but, um, yeah, so I have, um, you know, downtime or whatever time we have, um, gotten, got more into fitness running and, 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 uh, I was at F45 for a while and I love that. And so trying to, trying to get into my workout group here in Cooper city. Um, so, and, so we, you got to talk to me about the, the running. I, I took up running probably a year, a little less than a year ago, and okay. I've been pretty active. I mean, I'm 44 and, and my body half the time takes takes some serious time to recover, but I'm always running around Cooper City. Like if you're into running, man, and you want to go out for a run, any part of those 45 yeah. minutes a day workouts outside, yeah. I mean, I'm down to run a 5K pretty much I'm whenever. Down. Yeah, you're, I, you're, right, uh, you're right close to me, so. My my wife is a marathon runner, um, and I have run a couple half marathons with her. When I hit about thirty, was when my knee started hurting when I ran. So now I wear like a 
compression brace and pokas man these are the best running shoes they I, I mean, I know people talk about on clouds now and they love those too, but these hokas saved my ability to be able to run. My knees don't hurt anymore. You know, I, I got to get a pair of hokas. I have, I have a pair of Brooks, but okay. that's it. That's it for running. And I've already yeah. put quite a few miles on them. So yeah. Hoka's and you gotta get it. You have to get, when you start to feel it again, go get new shoes. Cause you don't realize how many miles you've put on them and they do wear out and, and, and your knees will start hurting again, you know? Yeah, for sure. So, man, I, I I would love to run a marathon at some point. I mean, I, yeah. I guess start with a half. I haven't even made. I think the longest I've made it is close to around nine miles, maybe. Which was it's just brutal on my body, dude. I gotta tell you, if you can do nine or ten miles running by yourself, you can do a half in a giant group of people. You could, yeah, you, you get could, that extra motivators around you, watching other people go. Your adrenaline will just be pumping. You'll be exhausted, sure, but you'll keep going. Um, you could do an extra four miles, believe it or not, if you got those people around you. That's one of the things I notice. One of the things I love about running specifically is that for me, like when I go running, it's always such a challenge. Even when I'm running a lot, it's all I always start. And even a few hundred yards in, I think to myself, oh, man, do I really want to run? Or am I going to be able to run five, six, seven miles today? But you're always able to continue. Like, yeah. And it's, it's just one foot ahead of the other. It's a mental game. And that's honestly like from all the people that I know that have done this 75 hard challenge thing that I just mentioned, um, some of them say like, yeah, I got in really good shape. But most of them say, man, my discipline after I finished that was just on a different level. That's what that's the biggest thing that most people kind of say they took away from it was just the challenge of because this is, you know, your weekends. You're still you still need to get up early on your weekends and get this stuff done. Right. Um, so it's yeah. just committing to something for 75 days. And, and, and not just that, obviously there's the commitment level, but it's, it's all about creating daily micro habits, little things you can do. And the more consistently you do them for the longer period of time, you're basically just rewiring your brain for sure to deal with adversity, adversity. Yeah, absolutely, so, man. Yeah. But on, the, on the other end of the spectrum, so fitness I've gotten more into, but I love craft beer as well. I love breweries, man. I, not, not for 75 days, you don't. Not for 75 days, but I'm coming back after that. <laughs> um, there's no, I, I, you know, I used to live out east. There's a lot more breweries out there. We got to, I got to, I got to talk to Cooper City. I got to talk to Davey. I got to figure out where we could put a brewery. <laughs> well, they got that place. What's that brewery on Pember? Isn't, is that a winery? Cooper's Hawk? Is that a brewery oh, too? Talk. Yeah, that's, that's a brewery, right? Wine, a wine bar. Yeah, that's, that's a wine bar. brewery. That's more of a wine spot. I, I don't, man, I got to be honest. I, I don't drink much yeah. at all anymore, man. If I have like the other day, I took the kids to Off the Wall. I took my son there with his friends. Yeah. One of my favorite jumping places to go because they actually have a little bar you could sit at and they have good food there. Yeah. And, um, and so I sat there and I was like, yeah, I'll have a beer. I had two beers. I, I was like tipsy off a beer and a half. I was halfway through my second beer. And I was like, man. But yeah, I just I just don't doesn't do it for me anymore. Every year the every year the tolerance changes and the next morning gets harder. And when you got two little kids running around, it's just not worth it like it used to be. But yeah, but I sure. still enjoy an IPA when I can. Seventy five days from now. <laughs> so there's a lot of parallels for me between something like running or this seventy five day hard challenge and what we experienced back in college, mm -hmm. the Southwestern program. For so. Sure. For folks out there that that don't know about the program, we alluded to it earlier earlier a little bit. Why don't you talk, tell a little bit about the program, and we'll maybe share some stories from the field. Um, it's I always tell people it's like it's the best and worst sales experience you can ever get. <laughs> um, it is it is it is boot camp. It is sales boot camp. Um, so you get recruited as a college student. I was at Florida State. Um, got recruited. Boo boo. Hey, I'm a <laughs> no, uh, we won't hold it against you. Right. Um, so I think I was 19, 20 years old when I got recruited. They recruit on these major college campuses um, over your summer. So the beginning of your summer, you go out to a week-long sales school in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's there that you learn where you're actually going to spend your summer. Um, so <laughs> from so you're telling your friends and family, like, I'm going to go. Oh. Outdoors, but I don't oh, know. man, they pull you as far away 
from home as possible so that when you want to quit it's a pain it's nearly impossible to get out of there like a much huge harder decision to leave so much harder to quit when you gotta drive <laughs> you know 15 hours back home but it but fit about 50 percent. i want to say about 50 percent quit by the halfway point of the summer it's about a third that have quit within the first three weeks i think um but but you find out while you're in Nashville where you're going to go. I, I did three summers. So I was in uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania, three different summers. What part of West Virginia? Beckley, West Virginia was where I was living. Okay. I had, I had a, a buddy that sold him. I think it was called Wheeling, West Virginia. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you heard of Wheeling or Wheeler? What's some obscure sure. place in West Virginia? A lot of places in West Virginia are obscure. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> And, and for me, like, I, so I grew up in South Florida, man. I grew up in Pompano. Like, all I've ever known is the beach and the city. I never knew, you know, rural, anything, really. So getting out to West Virginia was a major culture shock for me. But um, really, really good for you to, to get that kind of perspective. Yeah. So, so they take you. For us, we're down in South Florida, or at that yeah. time, FSU, UF. And then for me, I went to, at, outside of, um, first summer was, Port Huron, Michigan. Okay. And then I was uh, outside Cleve Cleveland, uh, second summer, and so they they take you up there. Tell tell everybody how we found a place to live for the summer. So I I know there was some people that had their their HQ set up with uh, with a host family in advance. Uh, well, I, lucky, I, I, lucky them. Yeah, I did not have that kind of fortune. My my first summer. Um, you get out there to the county that you're assigned and you literally start knocking on doors. Knocking on doors for a place to stay. <laughs> hey, do you, do you are you interested in hosting three college kids that, hey, we're going to work all day. We're, we're not even going to be here, but we need a place to, to rest our head at night. You can put us all in one room if you want. We don't care. And, um, and we'll pay you, you know, whatever. I think I paid like 40 bucks a week or something <laughs> in rent, you know. Uh, so the best, the best host families were empty nesters, the ones where yeah. their kids went away and they yeah. were looking my, for some life in the house. Yeah, my third summer, I lucked out. We found uh, Bonnie Benson and we lived in Bonnie Benson's basement, um, which, which was, it was, it was a, yeah, it was a big basement. It was me and three other guys, and we like kind of all had our own little quadrant of this basement. So. They were empty nesters. That one worked out really well. But my my first summer, I was in a like like a garage apartment, if you will. But it was not like built out. Like it was a plywood floor above the garage, and you know we're sleeping on mattresses and couches, and you know roughing it. But it's like you're a twenty year old. All part of the process. Yep. You you build character. You would start your days. Um, your work day would start by knocking on your first door before 8 a.m., 7.59 to be exact. You well, we got to go back first. For, for, first thing we would do is take cold showers. Take a cold shower, yeah. You can't, you can't uh, start without a cold shower. The problem for me, my second summer, they didn't have a shower in the house we stayed at. They only had a bathtub. So we weren't going to get in a cold – we weren't going to fill up the bathtub every morning. So we, we would go outside in the morning. And even though it was the summer, it was still a little chilly out. And they had a hose outside. And we would – hose each other down in the morning like 5 30 in the morning be a bunch of crazy kids dancing around screaming in the in the driveway getting hosed down wow that is man that's an experience <laughs> the oh, things man. the things that you're willing to do as a 20 year old that you look back at that as a 30 or 40 year old and you're like we were what were we thinking like we were thinking like just push every boundary because I need to make money this summer, <laughs> right? And then and then from there we go to the the breakfast spot, yeah, have a nice meal, and then we do our executive exercises. Yes, and I don't, uh, you know, I don't remember too many of the executive. I remember that it's a great day to be a bookman, of course. Yeah, but yeah. Oh, you never did the funky chicken, and we 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 used to go. We had breakfast right next to. a, a I don't know, big shopping plaza, and there was nobody there in the morning. And we did shopping cart races. Mm, nice. We would get yeah. the carts and run, like just all sorts of stupid shit. Whatever, whatever we could do to, to just make complete fools out of ourselves and get all the energy out, get all the endorphins rushing, so that when you did get to that first door at 8 a.m. or whatever time you started knocking, uh, yeah. you could muster up enough courage to you know, make that knock. <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever you could do to get out of your comfort zone before you got out of your comfort zone. 
Absolutely. Yeah. What I found though, as I move forward, obviously they train you about all this was that, that getting, getting those kind of set appointments in the morning and then towards the end of the day made yeah. it so much easier. It's just like a mindset standpoint. When you know that you had like three or four calls scheduled for that morning, you just felt better. You weren't randomly knocking on somebody's door at seven, seven thirty eight in the morning. <laughs> that was, that was gravy. You remember it? That was the term. <laughs> um, yeah. Gravy was, what was it? After five o'clock was gravy when you were catching all the people that were at home or if you had your morning appointment set up. Yep. That definitely made it easier. But if you were going to a new territory or a new area, you didn't have the opportunity to do that and you're just knocking on cold random doors. <laughs> so we, would, we started every day, 7.59 a.m., knocking on that first door and did not stop until, in my time at least, it was until after 9.00. 31 at night, the thir 13 and a half hour day. It's just madness. And, dude, I would not like, I wouldn't stop for lunch either. Like I would pull over to the side of the road, scarf a sandwich. And that was it. Like that was the brand. You had a car all three summers. I did. Yeah. Okay. I didn't have a car. The you first walker? Summer. Oh, yeah, the first summer walker. Man, that, that is, that's a different, that, there was no, no escape when you're walking, you get dropped mm -hmm. off by your roommate. It's like, see, yeah. see you in 14 hours. Yeah, in the summer heat, like I better, I better get in a door or else I'm gonna melt out here. Yeah, <laughs> wild, wild experience. Sure. I remember, I remember when I went looking for my second. I think it was my second summer. I went looking for a place to stay in a specific territory, and they always told you like the territory doesn't matter. Every one territory is as good as the next. Yeah. Something happened in this specific territory. Like there was a very bad taste in the mouth of many of the residents when it comes to door knocking, yeah. and we just got such a negative feedback from people when we were looking for a place to stay there. I was like, Jesus is a rough place. And one of the new recruits was selling in that territory. And a few weeks in, they hadn't sold anything. Dang. And so my manager was like, Hey, can you go follow? Could you go out in their territory and work with them and kind of let them follow you and see how it does. And I, I worked 14 hours that day, every waking second, as hard as I possibly could. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to show yeah. this new person that anything's possible. And I zeroed out that day. Wow. And I got such Again, I mean, I did, I did as good as I could, and I just got such negative feedback. I remember telling my manager, "I was like, I don't know, you might want to consider shifting territory for this new person because I don't know if they're going to make it out here." There, there was definitely exceptions like that. I mean, my so my first, my first day selling, at, so I was in West Virginia, and I was in this area where the second, the second door I knocked on, the guy was like, are you crazy? Like, you have no idea what just happened in this area, do you? And and I was in a valley and I didn't know what happened in a valley. And, West Virginia, and they were like, this whole town just flooded, man. Like everybody's, everybody is underwater here, like physically and money-wise, like nobody's buying books from you. And I still sold three people that first day. So that was the that was the side where they were right when they said your territory doesn't matter you can still go sell in this shit. But on the other hand, I had another <laughs> I had another territory where um, I went through the same thing as you, where nobody was answering the door for I knocked all day long. Nobody's answering the door for me. People are looking out the window and not answering the door or slamming the door in my face or whatever. And I get about, you know, three quarters of the way through the day. And finally, somebody opens the door and is like, man, you ever you wonder why nobody's answering the door for you today? They're like the 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 school system put out an all call that said not to open the door for you. That said <laughs> that, said, that said you said you're representing the schools, which that was, you know, for those of you who never heard of this program, that was the first thing out of our mouth was I'm not with the schools. <laughs> but um but you know so there was there was times where something like that happens and you kind of got to figure out okay is there another county i can shift to here <laughs> but, and thank god i did because then i ended up in um meade county in kentucky where fort knox was it was all military families and i loved that because people were just direct and straightforward and i had a great summer with those military families yeah Good so time. We're, we're often defined by hardships and challenges and like the, 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 the most difficult things that we've been through um, build the most character and yeah. make us stronger. Going back, looking through your journey, I, I obviously the, the experience from Southwestern certainly fits that bill. Oh, and yeah. you could talk a little bit more about that as well. But 
what's something that comes to mind in your journey that you've gone through, you've struggled with that you're better off for having gone through now? Yeah. Um, when, I mean, I, I got a, I got a long story. I don't know how far back we want to go here. We all have stories, right? But, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of just bring it back to the, to the beginning of real estate part where, um, when I first got into real estate, I joined a team that the only thing they did was cold call. Um, and so it was like, you know, Zillow leads and realtor.com leads and stuff like that would come in. And um, my job was to call the same lead three times a day, three days in a row <laughs> until they booked an appointment or booked a restraining order. We used. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. Yeah. Um, and th th there was nobody else like and I was in an office of 160 agents and there was nobody else in the office that was willing to do it all day like I was. Um, and that was a direct reflection of the three summers I spent selling books. My, my skin was so thick that I just didn't care when these people hung up on me. I knew I was there to provide value. I knew I was doing the right thing as they were the person that actually inquired on this house. Right. Um, and, and I sold 29 houses that first year in real estate by doing that. Um, I was the rookie of the year in an office of 160 agents. And it was because I was willing to just sit there and get hung up on all day that I was the able assistance, to the activity, the volume. I put together 48 transactions that year and closed 29. So I had 20 deals fall through mostly cause I just did, you know, there was things I didn't know what I was doing in that first year, but, um, and that was a direct reflection of all the doors that were slammed in my face in my early 20s, you know, knocking on doors. So having done door knocking and yeah. a whole bunch of cold calling, which do you prefer or which do you dislike less? Those those two things are the are kind of the same thing to me. Um, yeah. yeah, I so I'll tell you now. So I did for the first two years I was in real estate. It was all cold calling. When I opened Southwestern Real Estate, believe it or not, it was Southwestern Real Estate that was like, hey, we don't do cold calling. Even though when you were, were you know, spending your summers in college, all you did was cold call, knocking on doors. Um, but when I started Southwestern Real Estate and I started getting trained by them, they were like, actually, all we do is go into the community and build authentic relationships with people and trust that it's going to come back. Um, it was the literal opposite approach of cold calling and knocking on doors. Um, so there was a mindset shift there. Like it took a while for me to, to, to catch that mindset shift of like, okay, I'm just here to be a resource. Like, that's it. How do I make people buy and sell houses? <laughs> like, um, but, but just, you know, getting involved in as many things as I could, the chamber of commerce and Toastmasters, young professionals, organizations, and, you know, all these things that I was getting involved in, um, and just getting out there and building relationships and being a resource for people became how I built and compounded my business over the last six or seven years here. Um, and that, that is in my opinion, the most rewarding way to build a business is it's now I get to do business with people that I like and, and I get to receive a phone call like, Hey, can you come list my house rather than having to call people all day? And, um, so that's a beautiful thing. So, well, that's clearly yeah. a result of all of the hustle and hard work and the yeah. grind you put in to get to that point, right? Because yeah. you, you kind of got to, in many cases, you got to go through that first to get to the other side, which is Absolutely. where you're at right now. So part of part of what you do to build trust, credibility, make connections is putting out content, obviously on social media, educational content. It was that clip that you shared with uh uh, tell 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 everybody a little bit about that clip. That was, I thought it was very informative, and I think a lot um, of people don't realize that or don't even think about that as homeowners. Yeah. So I, what that clip said was, you can actually cut your mortgage from a thirty-year mortgage to a twenty-two-year mortgage by making one extra payment per year. So, and, and especially like when you're a new homeowner, when you've just bought a house, the majority of your payment is interest because um, the loan is amortized and the bank knows that's the best way for them to get their money first. Yeah. So if you make one extra payment per year, that's equal to whatever your normal monthly payment is, and you make that whole payment go towards the principal of your mortgage, 
because you're paying down more principal every year, your loan will go from a 30 30 year mortgage to about a 22 year mortgage. You'll cut seven to eight years off your mortgage by doing that. Yes. Save you a ton of money. Yeah. Banks yeah. don't like that. Banks like the slow drip. Yeah. And it and it depends what your what your goal is, right? Like if you're if you're like, well, I'd rather save that money so I can go buy more properties, well then you know that that'll accelerate your ability to build wealth if you can get more properties. But for for the for the average homeowner, if somebody doesn't want to be a real estate investor, quote unquote, um, then paying down your mortgage with principal will save you tons and tons of money and in interest over time. Love it. Any other tips? For uh, potential home buyers out there, anybody looking to maybe maybe they own a home and they're looking to buy an investment property, maybe they're yeah. you know, they're, they're renting right now and the rent's through the roof and it's time for them to buy. Yeah, um, you know? man, I could you know, tell me tell me when to stop because I can go on for a while. But the the average net worth of a homeowner in America is forty four times that of the average renter in America, yeah. um, and, and that is just because. When you buy a house, when you buy your first house, let's say you put down three and a half percent, 10 percent, 20 percent, whatever you put down, your out of pocket costs, let's call it 10 percent on a, a five hundred thousand dollar house. If you put down 50 percent, you're getting appreciation on the whole five hundred thousand. Right. So the bank financed 90 percent of it, but you get 100 percent of the appreciation as equity. Um, so it's not just the principal that you're paying down every month that's helping you build that equity. It's that Florida, Florida literally is the fastest appreciating state in the country. Um, and uh, so if you can buy dirt here, especially in Dade, Broward and Palm Beach County, where we don't really have more room to build houses, um, values are going to go up over time as long as you can hold that property. Um, so, uh, so yeah, buying property is going to grow your net worth a lot more than, than renting property. will. from an investment standpoint, one of my favorite types of properties to invest in, in South Florida are small multifamilies. <clears throat> so duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes. Um, there's, there's a strategy which me and my wife have done where we've bought in what you would call like a C class area, which is a lower, lower middle area, if you will. Yep. Um, and you get pretty strong appreciation and cash flow in those areas. Um, right now where interest rates are, properties aren't cash flowing a ton, if at all, but they're still appreciating really well. If, if you can buy a duplex, triplex or quadplex in like a downtown area or an area that surrounds downtown Fort Lauderdale, downtown Hollywood, something close to the beach, the value of those is that um, if you can find a good property manager, those can can be vacation rentals as well. Um, and you can you can actually net higher on those um, if, if the season's good, if vacation rentals are doing well at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you can if you can pick up. God, I said this many years ago and I didn't adhere to it. I've owned several properties, but I, I said this many, many years ago, man, I just want to get acquire one new property a year for like yeah. 20 years. And yeah. as long as you could, again, get a good property manager and make sure that there's positive cash flow coming in um, in those investments, given a long enough period of time, I mean, the equity is going to appreciate so much. I mean, so like a friend of mine, his parents started buying properties prior to COVID. Uh, Airbnb in them. I think they accumulated 10 plus properties and, and a lot of them over a million dollars. And after COVID, I mean, their portfolio shot up 100, 100, 150%. Yep. They're sitting on 10, 15, $20 million in equity. It's fantastic. They, you know, that, that rise that we saw in appreciation after COVID, we'll, we'll never see a year over year appreciation like that. I don't think again. Probably yeah, it was certainly an outlier, but I mean, over, time, over time you will like, like given enough, enough time. We, yeah, you will absolutely even even if appreciation is normal, right? Normal appreciation is about four percent year over year. Um, Broward County is six percent right now, um, but you know we saw twenty percent appreciation in some areas in in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one run, which was amazing. But yeah, if you can. Um, if, if you're kind of in the position that my wife and I were recently in where we had our first house, we were in Hollywood Hills area. Um, and that was a great first house for us. But when it was time to buy more house, 
we moved out to Cooper City, but we kept that house. And because the interest rate's so low on it, that property cash flows really well with what the rents are out there right now. And we, it's a long-term rental. Um, so, it, you, you know, you don't wait and buy real estate. You buy real estate and wait. If you can buy it and be patient, like it's going to appreciate, you're going to be able to write off deductions, you're going to have cash flow. It's all these things add up to, to really create wealth over time. Yeah. And don't try to time the market, right? So many people out there are waiting for the perfect conditions to buy. Yeah. Um, I, I've spoken with a lot of realtors on the show and really the right time to buy. The consensus is, is that when it's right for you, when you find the right property, especially if it's a house you're going to live in and exactly. when, the, when the numbers make sense for you. Yeah. Other and there's always, yeah, you're, you're a hundred percent right. There's always tools um, that you can use later to change the way it's financed. Right. So, it, but to your point in, in 2017, when we started looking for our first house, the market had already been rising for what is like a normal market cycle. Um, and so we were like, this has got to be the height of the market, right? Should we really, be, <laughs> we really, Little did we know. <laughs> should we really buy right now in 2018? Like this is probably the height of the market, right? It's got to settle down. And then it skyrocketed, of course. But, um, but I was already a real estate agent and I was thinking that at the time. So of course, like the normal consumer is going to be thinking that at any given time. Um, so just to kind of identify there, but it was the right time for us to buy and thank God we did. But in, in today's market, people are like, ah, well, prices are high and interest rates are comparatively high, right? Um, and affordability, like it's just tough right now adding all these things up. And while I definitely hear you on that, my wife and I still just bought a property in this market. And we know that like with this purchase, the market's not as crazy right now. So it's easier to negotiate right now on the front end with that price and, and credits. Um, and then to be able to refi the property later to a better interest rate or pay it down, whatever we decide to do. But there's tools to help with that financing side later. Yeah, absolutely. So in closing, why don't you share a little bit about how our listeners can reach you? What's the best way to connect with you for anybody that's out there that this conversation has resonated with where they'd like to speak with you? Maybe again, they're, they're looking for their first home, looking for yeah. an investment prop, whatever that looks like for them. If yeah. they would like to reach out to connect with you, how could they best do so? Sure. Um, I am, and I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. Like I love to sit down and analyze the market in any specific area. So if you're curious about what your neighborhood is doing, what your city is doing, um, wherever you are, your specific house value, any of that, I'm happy to help. Um, I send out monthly newsletters, uh, like I mentioned earlier, to, to people physically that want to stay up to date on the market. Um, but if you want to reach out to me, my phone number is 954-304-5186. Um, email is nicksprolsells at gmail.com. And then um, on Facebook or Instagram, I'm at Nick Sproul 954. Perfect. We'll, of course, drop a link in the description below to all of your contact information. Nick, it's a pleasure getting the opportunity to connect with you. It's always, always nice to connect with a, a, a former fellow bookman. So glad we how, did this, brother. How, how, how many times has that happened where you're like, oh, this guy's, I like this guy. I'm going to interview him. And then you find out they're a book person. That can't happen. <laughs> It, 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 it's this is the first time. Yeah, I love I will say this though. I was I spoke to my um, former manager Kian Ostevar. I don't know if you ever heard the name, and he connected me with uh, another bookman, Leighton Campbell, who okay. is down in South Florida now, and he's releasing a book early next year that he wrote. And so I scheduled the time for him to also come on the show to talk a little bit about what he's doing. So that'll be fun as well. Very cool. I, I have about six or seven other agents on my team that sold books as well that are throughout the state of Florida. So if you ever need more guests, you let me know. All right. Sounds good, brother. Take care. And to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. And we will catch everyone next time in the next episode of the Good Neighbor Podcast. Everyone have a wonderful day and stay blessed. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Good Neighbor Podcast, Cooper City. To nominate your favorite local business to be featured on the show, go to gnpcoopercity.com. That's gnpcoopercity.com or call 954-231-3170.